All right, how's everybody doing? Good? Everybody dry? Or drying out? <clears throat> Good. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray uh, one more time, and then uh, we'll jump into this. But uh, just before I do that, just want to say I'm glad that you're here, and and uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, thanks for coming. <clears throat> thanks for worshiping with us. It's awesome to, to, to be able to have you here with us uh, this morning and, and uh, be able to worship together. Um, let's uh, let's pray, and then uh, we'll we'll jump into the message this morning. <clears throat> Father, uh, we praise you for uh, who you are, um, Lord, and I uh, praise you for bringing us together uh, here in this place, uh, Lord, where we can, uh, we can worship together, where we can uh, encourage one another <clears throat> and, uh, and lift one another up. I thank you for the opportunity and the blessing to just to, to praise your name together as well. And Father, um, I just pray now as we move into to this time um, this morning, uh, that it would be your time. I, I, God, I just pray again that you would uh, take me completely out of this this message, Lord, and you would just speak um, through your word, and and we would hear God again exactly what it is you want us to hear, um, or whatever that be. That you would speak to every heart, Lord, and Holy Spirit, you know where each one of us is, and so um, I just pray, uh, man, in your power that that you would you would do that, and uh, we would know exactly. And what it is you want us to know and, uh, and how to act in that and how to move when we leave this building. So we do this, Father, in your name, for your glory's sake, God, and for the kingdom's sake. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, last week, if, you, if you're visiting with us or you, or you missed last week, um, you've probably noticed a big elephant on stage, right? Anybody miss that? Okay, didn't think so. Um, last week, we, we were only spending two weeks in this. This is the last one. But last week, we kind of introduced the idea of the elephant in the room. And uh, Dad spoke last week and just kind of introduced the idea of some changes that we're going to be making uh, in the fall. Um, some of those changes are, are being made because this service uh, is a service where we offer our, our 252 program for our, our kids. And uh, if you've been able to get over there at all, uh, you can see on, on a lot of Sundays we're busting out of the seams. We're, we're out of room uh, to the point where um, second graders are meeting in a closet um, to, to the back here. And, and so we got, we've been, been talking about this quite a lot and in the last few years it's been happening. And uh, so Dad was sharing a little bit last week of that. And what we want to do is... <clears throat> We want to do the best thing we can do uh, with what God has given us. Uh, we've talked building, and I know some of you are like, oh, when we mentioned that, and, and that's okay. Uh, we've talked about that. We've prayed about that. That's still on the table, God willing. We don't know where he's going to take us, but we're just going to follow the best we can. One thing that's been on the table for a long time that we've considered and been praying a lot about is offering another children's program at first service. Uh, first service has room to grow. And so, um, through, again, a lot of prayer and a lot of consideration, a lot of discussion, uh, we want to give that a shot in the fall, which means some changes, all right? So I'm just reviewing what Dad uh, talked a little bit about last week, just so we're all on the same page. Um, we sent out some letters to members this last week as well. Uh, but that means some time changes. Um, and so... Uh, we want to do, again, the best thing we can do, be the best stewards of what God has already given us in this building, and we think this is a great step um, and a great opportunity to, and, and a thing to try. And so uh, next fall, we'll be changing times of our services. So first service will begin at 845, giving a little bit more time uh, for, for kids, uh, families with kids, um, which if, if we're honest, most of our kids, if they're young, they're up pretty early, aren't they? Anyway, okay? I remember my kids waking up at crazy hours. I I don't know why, but they were up. Um, but we want to give a little bit more time for, for families um, who would like to come to first service, and we may ask some of you to do that, to make more room here uh, and, and over here uh, at 845, uh, and that will go from 845 to 10, okay? And then there'll be a half an hour like we have now in between, and the second service will start at 1030, so for you guys, that change will be 1030, and that will go to uh, 1145. Again, uh, why are we making these changes? Um, 
is again, we want to grow that first service and do the best we can before we start thinking about building um, is just take that next step of providing room and more room. So to this morning, uh, what we want to do is, is we want to uh, just challenge you. And there'll be challenges uh, throughout this, this message and praying that uh, God will speak through this um, as we move through it. Um, but we were excited and uh, we want to keep doing what, what uh, God is, is doing um, and how he's leading us uh, in growing. Uh, and really what it all comes down to is, is this. As followers of Christ, we have a message, right? Right? Okay. We've got a purpose. Uh, we, we've got a, a mission. And this, we have this incredible, incredible treasure, which we're going to talk about this morning, in Christ. Remember, we're called to share it. Um, beyond just Sunday mornings and doing church, we're called to share it. Uh, at our jobs, in our families, at our schools, wherever we find ourselves, we are called, and our purpose and our mission, if you are a follower of Christ, you've given your life to Him, this is your purpose, is to make disciples is to think with kingdom mind and have kingdom eyes, eternity eyes, eternal eyes and making disciples. And God willing, as we're doing that and as we get a better grasp of this and as we keep learning and growing as a church family of what this looks like in my life and in your life, outside of these walls, God willing, we'll keep growing here, right? So we can come and we can encourage one another and we can support one another. We can worship together. The things we've been doing on Sunday mornings, we want to keep doing that. We want to keep growing. That's why we're here is to make disciples and to walk alongside each other. And Sunday mornings just plays a small part of that, really. It's just a small part. So, this morning, uh, I just want to be, uh, remind you, and uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, guys, um, this, this two weeks has really been for you guys who are members or have been here for a long time and you're, you're really active. If you're visiting, you're going to listen in, you're going to hear what we're all about um, and where we're going, and we want to invite you back to be a part of that as well. Um, but uh, we want to be reminded um, that the church does not exist for itself, we are not here to be at the NLCC club. Everyone is welcome. Everyone who is out there who is lost needs Jesus is welcome to worship with us. And we will walk alongside them. Um, this church does not exist for itself. The church worldwide under Jesus Christ does not exist for itself. We are here for the lost and he has called us to go to them on his behalf. How amazing is that? That he's asked you and me to do that on his behalf. That's his plan, and we want to be a part of it. So let me ask uh, some questions, and I'm going to ask a few this morning, um, as we do a lot. Here's the first one, and I ask, ask yourself this, as, as I've asked myself, do I have this mindset? Do I have this mindset that I'm going to do whatever it takes to share the gospel? That I understand my mission, I understand my purpose, uh, on this planet, breathing in and out as a follower of Christ is not to make money and have a great retirement and die happy. That's not our purpose. That's not our mission. Our mission is to make disciples who go make disciples. Is that our mindset as we've come into this place this morning? I just want to present that question to you. As, as we've been working on it all week. This has been working on me all week. Is this my mindset that I'm going to do whatever it takes at all costs to grow the kingdom to love the lost, to be Jesus to those people who need Jesus. What do you think? What's your life say? Are you pursuing that at all costs? I got to thinking about this, what this looks like in other aspects of life. Uh, and in my own life, one, one thing came to my mind and that was uh, this idea of, of, of going after something at all costs uh, is when I, when I met my wife. Um, and uh, I remember going to school swearing off girls because uh, girls are just trouble, right? And then I saw, I saw Beth sitting at the registration in, in this little, you know, in this chair, and I thought, okay, Lord, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you know, and, and, and I, I went after my wife. I pursued my wife. I spent a lot of money on my wife. I, I found out just as we became friends that she liked pears. Now, I don't know if she likes pears anymore. I think I ruined her. Um, 
I worked two jobs that year, and I had a job early morning uh, at a grocery store. I worked in the produce section before class, and I would bring her home a pear. Every day I worked. And I found out later that uh, I supplied the whole girl's floor with pears. She started <laughs> handing them out. I don't know what to do with all these pears, and I don't want to hurt his feelings. So uh, I don't know if she likes pears to this day. But, um, and I, wanted, I did whatever it takes. I mean, I bought flowers. I bought pears. I bought f um, Capri Suns. She loved Capri Suns. I'd bring home these cases of Capri Suns. I just, I wanted to win her heart, and I pursued it with all I had, all the cash I had. You know, I'm amazing enough my good looks wasn't enough to, to win her heart, right? And so I, I, just, I just, that's one thing that stood out to me as I thought about at all costs, um, whatever it takes. Um, for me, I mean, I, I, it was to win best heart. And it worked, right? And have you been there before? Have you ever just kind of gone after something? Guys, you might relate to that a little bit, you know, as you, as you were uh, dating your wife and you knew she was the one, you went after her with all you had. And ladies, you might know what that's like as well too. And, and maybe other areas of life, maybe it was a job or, or a position in your job where you just worked really hard and you went after it with all you had and you had to sacrifice some time, you had to sacrifice money, you had to sacrifice even some family time, whatever it took to pursue that. Have you been there before, anyone? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. And thinking about this message and, and really kind of praying on it, um, uh, there were two, two people that came to my mind in the scriptures um, that kept popping up and was throwing ideas out at the staff and these two just kept coming back. So I want to talk about two, two guys in, in, in the scripture <clears throat> this morning when, when we think about doing whatever it takes at all costs. The first one was, is, is Nehemiah. You guys familiar with Nehemiah? And Nehemiah is found in the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with, with scriptures, Old Testament um, guy that, that lived then. And, and uh, Nehemiah was a guy who did whatever it took to get something done. Uh, here at NLCC, we've talked about Nehemiah before. I love uh, this story, this, this part of our history here. Um, Nehemiah left a really, a pretty good job. If you remember his story, he worked for the king. Uh, a risky job, but he was a king's cup bearer. He had to drink everything before the king, right? Risky job, but a good job working for the king. He had to leave his job. He had to leave uh, his home, the city that he lived in, everything that was familiar to him um, to do what? Do you remember? Anybody remember? Nehemiah was called to rebuild the the walls of Jerusalem, right? Right. He had got news from his brother uh, that that the Jews had, had been released. They were they were um, coming back from being exiled, and many of them had moved into the city of Jerusalem. And the city for Jer of Jerusalem, uh, and, and the Jewish nation was a huge city, right? Uh, a great city. But the walls had been ruined. They were in ruins. They had been knocked down. They had been burned. It was a mess. His brother came and told him, and it moved his heart. Moved him, moved him to tears. He mourned, he fasted, and he spent time in prayer. And the Lord asked him to go rebuild the walls. That's what was laid on his heart. He wanted to do something about it. And what did he do? He did it. He moved. There was action involved. So with the king's permission, he traveled to Jerusalem and he inspected the walls, spent some time inspecting the walls, making a plan. He presented the plan to his people, challenged them to rebuild the walls, and they set out to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This is a pretty incredible part uh, of history. Um, we're going to read a little bit of this today. And the thing is, is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in that day was not an easy task. They didn't have backhoes and forklifts and all the equipment we have, and they got it done. These were huge, huge walls. And they got it done. Nehemiah and these, this, these groups of, of Jewish families began to rebuild the walls. And as you read through Nehemiah, there's a few things that stand out in this, in this awesome story. And, and one of those this morning that I want to bring out and be encouraged by, I want this to be a challenge, um, but my prayer is it will be an encouragement as well. As we look at Nehemiah, as he did whatever it took, he did whatever it took in the face of opposition. When you know his story. We're going to read about this. He did whatever it took in the face of opposition. So I wonder if we can't be challenged by that for us as we look to the future, as we move ahead in our mission and our purpose and making some changes and, and doing whatever it takes to reach the lost. 
that we need to do whatever it takes in the face of opposition. Whatever it takes. From the very start, when these people started building the walls, they were opposed. From the very start, we see it right away in chapter two, um, and, but we're gonna move to chapter four because we're gonna get a cool glimpse of what's going on here. And I want you, if you can, to read along. It'll be up on the screen as well. And bear with me, I'm, I'm on the end of a cold, okay? So I'm gonna do my best to, to, not, to keep the coughing and the sniffling at the minimum, but I'm not gonna guarantee it. <laughs> so uh, just bear with me as we read through this. Um, in chapter four, Nehemiah, I'm gonna start with verse seven. And keep in mind here the whatever it takes, okay? Try to catch this as we read through this and see this mindset here. Verse seven, as, as they're rebuilding the walls. Verse seven, when Sambalat, Tobiah, uh, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, the men of Ashad, heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to, uh, to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's uh, so much rubble that we can, cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard uh, that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Did you catch that? Everyone had something to do. Verse 16, from that day on, half my men did the work, while other half, by the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and, armors, and armor. The officers po uh, posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Listen to this one, whatever it takes. Those who carry materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Now, do you, do you see that picture? We've got a purpose, we've got a mission, we're gonna get it done, we've been opposed, but we're gonna do whatever it takes to get this done. What an incredible picture to the point where the guys who were carrying the materials were carrying it in one hand and had a sword in another. Talk about whatever it takes, right? What an awesome, awesome picture for us. They built this massive wall in spite of the opposition, in the face of opposition. Do you know how long it took? How many days? You guys read ahead. How many days did it take them with the Lord's help? 52 days. That's amazing. That's incredible. With the Lord's help, in the face of all that opposition, some working with one arm, 52 days they built the walls of Jerusalem back up. And these people had a mission. They had a purpose. They, they moved together, each doing their own part. Families doing their own part, no matter the cost, whatever it took. This took dedication on these people. This took sacrifice. This took commitment, unity, and they got it done. They got it done with the Lord's help. Again, last week, Dad talked about our mission and our vision um, in the first part of this. And, and uh, I, love, I love how simple it really is. And, and as, as we keep moving forward, listen, we want to grow. Um, as long as there's one lost person out there, we want to grow by one. That's what Dad said. As long as there's one lost person who doesn't know Jesus Christ out there, we want to keep growing by one. Does that make sense? Listen, that's your job and my job. That's our job, those lost people. And as long as they're one, we want to keep growing by one. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, this is our mission. 
to make disciples, to love them, to serve them, to introduce them to Jesus, not to judge them, not to berate them, not to picket them, to love them in the name of Jesus. Are we on the same page there? Jesus will change them, not us. That's our job. And then we walk alongside them like we do one another in life as we disciple. Now, Nehemiah here faced, as we think about opposition, he faced literal physical opposition, right? Death was at his door. Um, that's not the case for us here. We don't face really, you know, physical death threats. So someone's gonna come in because we're meeting in Jesus' name. That doesn't happen to us. And so I got to thinking, what kind of opposition do we face? And what I think, honestly, in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a, it's a sneakier opposition and in a ways maybe more dangerous because um, things slip in with us. And so, so I just wanna ask some more questions. We're gonna put these up. Um, what opposition am I facing? Can you ask yourself that? Write that down. Uh, pray over this this week. What opposition am I facing? Now, again, it, it, it probably is not someone physically threatening you because you follow Jesus. So what's that look like? Another way to say that is what's getting in the way of our mission, of your mission to make disciples. If you're a follower of Jesus, listen, your mission is to make disciples. And Dad said it, I don't know if it was last week, but if you're not making disciples, something might be off. Disciples make disciples. That's our pattern. That's our example. What's getting in the way? What opposition am I, f am I facing, keeping me from my mission, our mission together? Um, we've talked about this before. Here's a big one. You know what I think gets in the way? And again, I think it's sneaky, but it's here. It's in the church, in our country especially. Busyness. I don't face a guy that, with a sword chasing me down. I face a schedule and an enemy who wants to keep me way busier doing other things than what's most important. So I do good things, but not always what's best. Make sense? I think it's business. Time is huge for us. Time. Um, it, it gets in the way because we're busy doing so many other things. Guys, we've preach this over and over and over again. Church just becomes a checklist. The things of God just become something we do, not who we are. Another one is, is apathy. This, this, this is in the church. Again, it's just, you know what? I'm good doing what I'm doing. We talked about this in Galatians a lot. I'm good. I follow the rules. I'm a good person. I'm a moral person. Good enough. And we don't care if, if there are lost people out there. We just kind of, eh, as long as I'm good, I'm good. Apathy sneaks in. It's these internal battles. Some, sometimes what, what opposes us and what keeps us from our mission is we say, look, I can't do that. Like, I can't do what he does. I can't share my faith. I don't know how to share my faith. How many of you guys were a part of Rooted? Raise your hand. Because if you aren't and have not been, you need to be in the fall. We learned in Rooted that we can share our faith and as is simple as sharing our story. That's it. You don't have to know this in and out. I don't know this in and out. I don't have all the answers. No one does. We're learning and growing together. It's as simple as saying, this is who I was before Jesus. This is how I met him. And man, this is how he's changed my life. That's all you have to do. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. All of us can. It's that simple. Isn't that good news? You don't have to be a Bible theologian. You just have to be a life changed by Jesus. Are there lives in here changed by Jesus? Amen. So, so, you know, the I can't, we need to kick that out. Sometimes it's just a matter of priorities. Our priorities are out of whack. They really are. They're out of whack. And again, I, I always go back to that picture of, of a bicycle wheel or a motorcycle wheel. At the center of that wheel is the what? The hub, right? The hub. And it's just a picture for us. And out, out of that hub comes what? Spokes. Too many of us are making our families the hub. We're making our jobs the hub. We're making extracurricular activities the hub. We're making sports the hub. We're making entertainment the hub. And Jesus is just another spoke on the wheel. That is the exact opposite of what we're called to do. Christ is meant to be the hub. Everything else springs out of that. Does that make sense? That's a great picture, and that really helps me. Christ is the hub. Not your family, not your job, not your sports, not your entertainment, not mine. 
And I can easily, I'll just be honest, I can easily make other things the hub in my life. It's a constant battle for me. I'll just be honest with you. It is for me. And our priorities, if that's the case, our priorities are, they're goofed up. It's opposition. And those things sneak in. So, so a question is, are all those things winning in your life right now? It, do you have a mindset of whatever it takes for us to keep growing? And, and, you know, last year we talked about I'm in. And a lot of you signed some cards saying I'm in. Really, are you in? Are you ready to do whatever it takes for us as a church to keep growing and reaching the lost? Are you really in? Or, or have you signed it and just said, you know what, someone else will do it. We got the staff. Staff will do it. It's our job. All of our job. What's your mindset? Nehemiah stayed focused. He knew his mission. He had a passion for it. He was intentional. Nehemiah saw what could be. Guys, and look what happened. The walls were built in 52 days. He saw what could be. And amazing things happened. Another person I thought of as we've got to move on. Uh, they had this mindset, this whatever it takes, at all costs mindset. I'm going to share the gospel. I'm going to move forward in Jesus was Paul, right? Another one is just obvious. Right away, um, Paul, Paul stood out to me. And, and uh, Paul, when you look at his life, did whatever it, whatever it costs. He did whatever it takes at personal cost. And that's our second challenge as we move forward as a church family is, is we do whatever it takes at personal cost, because it'll cost something. And again, th there's, there's so many places we could go in here when we look at Paul's life. Uh, just an awesome example of someone who did whatever it took. Uh, Jesus completely changed his life, interrupted his life in a huge way. If you remember his story, totally turned him around and sent him on a mission that he died for, that he went to prison for. Um, so many cool things Paul did. Jesus was Paul's greatest treasure. He talks about that in 2 Corinthians 4. We're gonna go there. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Listen to what he says. Oop, I gotta go there. It says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. Now, what's he talking about, this treasure? He talks about it in the verses previous. So I want to back up and I want to read verse 6 as he's talking about this, this treasure, this light that God has given us, that Christ has given us in us. Look at verse 6 and we're going to read 6 and 7 again. For God said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. Makes sense? So this treasure is who? Christ. Christ. The jars of clay he's talking about is what? Us, our bodies, right? And he's given us this picture and he gives us this incredible contrast here. This jars of clay, when you think about jars of clay, jars of clay chip, right? Right? They, they break sometimes, um, they fade, they crack, and, and Paul is saying, look, we have this treasure, Christ, in these jars of clay, these fragile things, to understand and know that this power comes not from the jars, not from us, but from what's inside of us. How cool is that? How cool is that? This treasure that we have, Jesus in us, this light that he's given us in our hearts, these broken bodies that chip and break. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling more chippy and breaky every day. But praise God, our power comes from Jesus inside. Inside. What a cool picture as he's talking about this. Real value, real strength, real power comes from him. Let's keep reading 8 through 12. In context, again, we have this power that comes from God, not us. So we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. 
We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Paul talks about this treasure and this faith and he knows exactly what these verses mean. As we, as we looked at those, persecuted but not abandoned, we're hard pressed but not crushed, perplexed but not destroyed. Paul knows what this is like. He knows what this is like. You go ahead and read 2 Corinthians 11 where Paul lists all the things he's gone through for the sake of the gospel. I've been shipwrecked, I've been whipped, I've been imprisoned, I've been, he goes through this huge list, go read that. Paul knows what it's like to be uh, persecuted. Paul knows what, what hardship is like. He knows these things. He knows what sacrifice is. And he still does it. He still did whatever it took. Another one I thought of was 1 Corinthians, that first letter, chapter 9. He's talking to the Corinthians. He's telling them, look, I'll become whatever I need to become, and, and this is paraphrased, obviously, to make the gospel known. I'll, if, if, if it's I'm going to the Jews, I'll become Jew. If it's non-Jews, I'll become a non-Jew. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get the gospel to these people. Look at verse 22. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Is he doing this for his own sake so that people will worship Paul? No, for the sake of the gospel. Whatever it takes. And as we look at Paul's life, if you're familiar with it, we see that in his life. Sacrifice. Again, just like Nehemiah, determination, commitment, dedication. I was thinking about a story, maybe some of you have heard this before. It's about a farmer who was driving down the road one day and he noticed a sign uh, by the local airport. And the sign said this, experience the thrill of flying. Well, the farmer thought to himself, he's like, hey, ma'am, tomorrow's my wife's birthday. You know, may maybe um, I'll, I'll just buy her this. I'd love for her to experience the thrill of, of flying. That'd be a great birthday present. So the farmer went into the airport, and after some time, he find a pilot who would, who would take him and his wife on a flight um, over their farm. So the pilot owned a small open cockpit plane. And uh, he, he uh, said, you know, certainly, you know, this is going to be a thrill. This is going to be cool for my wife. And, but the pilot's price was a little too high. So the farmer bartered with the pilot for a long time, and he, he kind of insisted on a, on a lower price. And finally, the pilot agreed to the lower price um, on one condition. The farmer and his wife had to promise not to say a single word during the entire flight. One word spoken aloud, however small, would increase the price to the pilot's original fee. So the farmer's determination uh, to give his wife the thrill of flying was only surpassed by his determination to spend as little money as possible. So he agreed to this condition. The next morning, the three of them took off, and soon they were, they were high up in the air, and the pilot knew that if he did a few roller coaster dips and turns with the plane, the couple in the back seat would soon speak up, and he would receive the higher price. <clears throat> well, with that in mind, the pilot dipped, and he turned, and he climbed, and he dived, and he even did a few loop-de-loops, but not a sound was heard. Not a scream, not a whimper, nothing but silence. So as they were landing, the pilot was pretty amazed at the determination of these people, these passengers. He yelled back to the farmer. He said, hey, I can't believe you didn't say something up there. I mean, I dipped and I turned and I climbed and I loop-de-looped. -looped. I've done things I've never done before. Man, I guess you win. Well, the old farmer shouted up front. He said, well, you almost won, son. You almost won. Because I sure felt like hollering when my wife fell out. <laughs> Determination. Uncompromising. <laughs> and I'll give you know, a, a goofy example. But when it comes to pushing forward with the gospel and loving those people, we have uncompromising determination. 
We have to keep going. As hard as it is, and it's hard, because sometimes we get dumped on. Sometimes we get hurt. We get rejected. All kinds of stuff. But we got to keep going and keep strong with our mission. Let's keep reading. Uh, we're going to go 13 through 15. We've got to keep moving. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken with that same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit so that the grace, so that the grace that is reaching, listen, more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. There's that mission again. It's more and more people. Paul's being faithful. They're being faithful. It's reaching more and more people. Let's keep going. These verses are awesome. Listen to how he winds this up. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What kind of mindset is Paul presenting here? Kingdom, right? Vertical, not horizontal. Eternal, kingdom-minded. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, which is the horizontal, what we see right now. That's not where our focus is, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, right? For what for is unseen is eternal. Does it make sense? He's encouraging them. Keep focused. Keep your eyes up. Keep your eyes vertical on the unseen, not the horizontal. That stuff's temporary. He's encouraging them here. As Paul continued to have faith, he's encouraging the ten you have faith. Paul could see what happened, right? He saw that he could see what could happen. Man, look what happened in Paul's life. Look at all the people that found Jesus because Paul kept going. He saw what could happen, and look what happened. How many churches started? And when, these are just a few. The Corinthian church, the Philippian church, the Galatian church, the Ephesian church, the Colossians church, you know, the Thessalonian church. Those are just a few that Paul was a part of starting. He saw what could happen and, and look what happened. Whatever it takes, no matter the cost. And Paul was imprisoned. I mean, he was tortured and killed for his faith. So here's another question. As we think about Paul, has following Jesus cost me anything? Has it cost me anything? Am I really all in? I'm kind of just partly in. I'm in on Sunday mornings, maybe a small group or a Bible study, but that's it. Am I all in? Has is it, is it cost me anything other than just an hour on Sunday mornings? It's going to cost you an hour and a half on Sunday mornings, maybe two if you like to talk and spend time after church. Does it cost you more than that? Sometimes, um, church costs us things. And Jesus, following Jesus costs us things. Not church, let me, let me take that back. Jesus does. And, and if this is just what you do, all right, and, and, and if this is just church to us and, and Christianity is just your, your, your duty or, or your title and it's not who you are, then you've settled for something that's not Jesus. You've settled for something subpar. I've done that before. It's, it's, it's subpar. It's unfulfilling. Again, I've been there before. I've, I've, I've turned things around and I've started settled for this. It wasn't Jesus. It was something else. And it was subpar. It didn't fill me up at all. Actually, it frustrated me. And honestly, it's dead. Because he is life. He is life. He is the freedom. And really following him will cost us something. Sometimes it costs us friends. I've seen that happen. Seeing people who have come out of a sinful life find Jesus and make changes and they lost some friends who wanted nothing to do with it. Sometimes it costs us uh, family members. I've seen that. Remember when Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace to, but bring a sword? You know what he was talking about? There are people in our families who may not believe what we believe. They may not follow Jesus. They may decide not to, and that separates sometimes. Same with friends. You, you may lose some friends. You may lose some family members. You may lose a position at work because of your faith and you won't compromise because they want you to do something that's uh, immoral or wrong. You know, no way. 
You, you may have to lose some of your time serving other people, even when we don't feel like it. It may cost you time. You may have to make some sacrifices in following Jesus. We're gonna have to sacrifice our pride and self. There's a cost. Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. That sound familiar? Daily? There's a cost. Has it cost you anything? I love Paul's words in Philippians. He's, he's talking to the Philippian church and he's saying, look, I mean, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I had all this knowledge. I was trained under the best teachers and I had worked my way up and all these things. I had all this stuff. I had this huge giant position, this high position. And he said, you know what? I counted all as garbage. I counted all as garbage compared to knowing Jesus. It's in Philippians. It's garbage. At all costs. He wanted to know Jesus. That's a mindset, you guys. That's a way to think. That's a heart condition. That's a way to live. Is that our mindset? Is that your heart condition this morning? And we have a treasure. We have a message. We have a mission. And again, the question is, are we really in? Are we in? And we are called to move together, to do this together. And we need you. As we move into the, into the fall, we need you. And, and again, let me say that so many of you are serving in so many areas. And you are so selfless. It's awesome. But we need all of you. Especially in the changes we're making. So I want to I kind of wrap up. And, and if I can, just challenge you to pray over these questions we've already asked. And spend some time with those this week. Bring those to him. Talk about them with, with each other and in your small groups and, and with, your, with your spouses or your family or whatever. Talk about those things. And let me ask you that, and I want to I challenge you with this too. If you've been a member here for a while, if, if you are a member here, it doesn't even matter if you've been a while. If you've placed your membership here, you've said to this church family and to God, I'm in here. This is my home. This is where I'm plugging in. So I, I'm not going to pull many punches with you, okay? Out of love. I'm not going to pull any punches with members. Please listen to this. I want you to consider playing your part in the changes coming up. And I want to challenge you to do something. Because some of us have been members for years and we're not doing anything but coming and maybe writing a check. I'm sorry. We need you. We need you to be a part of this. And if we offer another children's program for service, we need people to minister to those kids. So will you prayerfully consider stepping up and asking the Lord, how can I be involved with this? What can I do? Eternalize, kingdomize. It may cost you time. Yep. That may mean you might need to move your family to first service so you can help and then be at church, second service. You know what? People are already doing that. Praise God. I can name a couple right now who come to first service and they're, they're, they're serving your kids right now. That's awesome. We need more of that. We just do to keep the kingdom growing. So will you consider what, what you can do in partnering with us in doing this? And, 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 that, and again, that may be switching some services so you can help. It just may mean to make more room. Look, I'm gonna take my family to first service so we can open up more room for the kids' side and more room in here uh, for them. It may mean that. Um, first service had the same challenge. It's not just you guys. They're being challenged too. It may mean they, they need to help first service and come to second service. But we're moving forward in this. What will you do? How can you partner with us in this? Guys, the thing is, is this is really exciting stuff. It is not a bad thing. It's an amazing thing. It's an incredible thing that these families are coming and that we're growing uh, with young families and young kids. And, and it's an amazing thing that we have to meet in a closet because we're out of room. How awesome is that? We gotta make more room, guys. We gotta use what we got, and this is what we got. So that means we gotta do some shuffling around in the fall to make more room for more people. Praise God, amen? Are you guys alive? It's awesome. It's awesome, and we don't wanna stop. We don't wanna stop. We're out of room, and an out of room means we're hitting that ceiling. Dad talked about that last week. We're hitting that ceiling. Okay? And we got to do something or we're not going to grow anymore. And eventually, you know what happens? Usually, you start going like this. No way do we want to do that. We got to do what it takes to keep growing.
keep growing, keep reaching the lost. Um, eternal, eternal view. Um, look ahead and see what can be, like these guys did. And see what God can do. And make an intentional decision to get involved, play your part. And here's the thing, I want to tell you this, I want to let you know this. Your elders that are here and your staff will lead in this. Just so you know, the elders will be involved in first services and they will be taking their turns in 252 first service in the fall. They're going to be doing that. They're going to be doing that. Just so you know that. Your staff is going to do whatever they can, the staff here, to help first service with the children's um, as we open that up in the fall. They will be helping as much as they can, however they can, over here until that thing gets up and running. They are leading the way. I just want you to know that, okay? That your elders will be hanging out with your kids at first service. Teaching. Doing whatever they can. Isn't that cool? That they're willing to do that? I love that. That they're leading the way there. It's pretty awesome. So, as we close, and I gotta close, I just wanna take the last few minutes, okay, to, to just imagine a little bit, all right? Um, just kinda, kinda think about what could be, and as we do this, and as I thought about this even first service, um, some of this stuff is already happening. Many, much of it is already happening, but as we keep looking, man, just, I just want us to th- imagine what else could happen. What else could happen? What else can God do? And so I want to kind of read through this, and I want to walk you through this. So I want you to just try to imagine. I want you to start to dream a little bit, all right, thinking ahead of what could be like Nehemiah did, like Paul did, and, and look at this. So I'm going to walk you through this, and uh, this is cool. This is exciting to me. So imagine what this would be like, right? I want you to imagine a group of followers, and again, some of this is happening, but a group of followers who are experiencing real, true community, what I mean by that is, is this is a group of followers who have a place where they really belong and they feel they, they know they belong. They don't feel it. They know they belong. Where they can come and they can be real, right? So when they can walk in the door and they've had a really crappy week, they can say it. I have not had a good week. Would you pray with me? And someone will come alongside them and pray with them. Someone who can, who, or, or imagine a church who can come in and you can be transparent. You can be safe, where you can be loved no matter what. So if you're struggling with a sin and you feel dirty and shameful and it's a dark sin and it's a, it's a nasty sin, you don't have to come walking in, the door, in these doors feeling like everyone's looking at you going, you're a terrible person because you did that. You come walking in the doors, you can find someone in this church and, and confess your sin and know that you're gonna be loved no matter what. Imagine that. Not feeling any eyes on you or judgment, but love and grace as you come to repent or confess something and having someone come alongside you and say, look, you're not alone, man. I do that too. I struggle with that too. Imagine what that would be like. Imagine what it would be like to have a real tangible, like grab hold of it, sense of purpose and mission. Like we're not just kind of reaching out and we know our mission, but we kind of, but, but specifically for me, I know exactly what God wants me to do. And I know how to plug in here. And, I, and I'm on board with everybody else. Imagining, imagine having to understand that, or understanding that the best we can. To know your calling. To really have a clear picture of this treasure that we just read about inside of us to really have a clear picture of the power inside of us, that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, that he works in us, that he works through us, and that we would have a passion to share it with the lost. Those who are prisoners in their sin and don't even know it. What would it be like to really grab a hold of that tightly and understand that clearly? What would that look like as a church family? What would it look like to to actually, actually play a part in seeing someone get set free from sin? You ever thought about that? Maybe some of you experienced that. I get to play a part. I love that person. All I did was love them in Jesus' name and they saw Jesus in me. Praise God, I don't know how, but they did. They saw past this goofiness and they saw Jesus and, and, and they wanted to know more and through that I gotta work with them and teach them. I gotta play a part. And then being set free from their sin, I gotta see them accept Christ and I gotta see them make the decision to obey and be baptized and be set free. Imagine seeing relationships restored, seeing families becoming stronger, being a part of a church family again that is intentionally reaching out and making disciples. Intentionally. Being selfless, putting others first. Being humble as they serve and quick to serve where they're needed. And again, I see so many faces. That's you. You're doing that. We were so blessed here. Quick to serve when there's a need. Boom, boom, I'll do it. 
Praise God. Praise God. Doing whatever it takes in the face of our culture who is throwing everything else at us and just making our church life one other thing we do. Making Jesus somebody we, you know, we just kind of know about. But replacing who we are, trying to. Imagine what that would be like. Going the same direction, this huge, I just picture it as a tidal wave, right? This huge tsunami of Jesus followers. <laughs> Move in the same direction. Powerful. Powerful. Just taking over Southeast Iowa and all over the world. We have people all over the world that are tied to NLCC. Imagine what that would be like. So I want to encourage you and I want you to imagine, see what can be. And here's the challenge. We can imagine pretty easily. Here's where we get tripped up. It's in the do part. It's in the what can I do part. What's my, what's my part? It's in the move part. And so please be praying. Please be praying. God, how can I play a part in where we're going? What can I do? Guys, we're gonna need people to spend some time with the kids at first service. That's a need. Are you hearing me? That's a need. Now, I don't want you to feel guilty and go, well, if no one else is gonna do it, then I'll do it. Because then you're not doing it for the right reasons. That's not what we're looking for. I'm just gonna be honest with you. We're not looking for leftovers and, oh, okay, whatever, I'll do it because they don't want it. That's not what we're looking for. But, if, but I'm praying that if God moves your heart, and I'm praying that, believe me, we're praying that, that God would move hearts and if you're feeling that, please help. And remember the big picture. Yes, it's going to cost you time. Yes, it's going to cost you some things. It's going to mess up your schedule on a Sunday morning. Okay, but, but why, why are you here? Why are we here? Um, guys, it's exciting, man. It really is. It's cool. And, and I'm so excited to see where God's going to take us and what's going to happen. And uh, we just want you to be on board. All right? Amen? All right. I'm going to have you stand up. We got to be done. One minute left. So much for 35-minute sermons like Dad advertised last week. <laughs> <coughs> We're working on it. Um, guys, we love you, and, and I hope you're excited. I hope you're getting that. If you've got any questions, please talk to the elders. Talk to Dad. Talk to me. Talk to any of our staff. They're pretty much in the loop on most of this stuff. And, and so um, please ask questions. Um, and if, if you're feeling a twinge, and um, please come say, hey, I think maybe I could help here. Anything. Um, we we, we want to we wanna be able to plug you in and be a part of this. It's, it's awesome. And, guys, it's so cool to serve together. It's so cool to serve together. Um, if you're not serving with, with a team somewhere, you're missing out. I'm just saying it. You're missing out. Um, it's a blessing. Let's pray. We'll be done. Father, I thank you for this morning, and I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for moving. I thank you for this church. I thank you for, um, God, your grace, your, your, um, your forgiveness in our lives, your faithfulness to us. Um, help us really see the truth. Help us see with your eyes, with kingdom eyes, um, look past what's right in front of us. Um, help us give up ourselves. Man, Lord, I know I can be so selfish, especially with my time. Help us let go. That people will see you in us, that they'll be drawn to you. Help us take this outside of these walls and be the church. God, we need your help in this, and I, and I just I pray for it. I just pray for your help. And I just pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You're deployed.